This week on Quadriga, Ukraine election, step towards stability? Ukrainian voters go to the polls on Sunday to elect a new parliament. President Petro Poroshenko, who was elected in May, moved the vote forward by three years in hopes of gaining a stable governing majority. His pro-Western bloc is expected to dominate the new assembly. But the country is highly polarised. In eastern Ukraine, where pro-Russian separatists have called out an independent republic, there are calls for a boycott of the elections. Months of armed conflict between the rebels and Ukrainian government forces and volunteer militias have claimed thousands of lives. In this heated atmosphere, can Sunday's vote bring stability to Ukraine? Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Polls indicate that the new Ukrainian government will most likely have broader support, but will it also truly be more stable? That's what we want to talk about today on Quadriga with three guests who've been following events in Ukraine closely. It's a pleasure to welcome Ina Melinkovska. She's a political scientist and economist originally from Ukraine, now working as a research fellow at Berlin's Free University, focusing on political and economic processes in Ukraine. And we're pleased to have back on the program Lucien Kim. He's an American freelance journalist who has reported extensively from Ukraine for Slate, for Newsweek, for AP, and for other media. He previously covered Eastern Europe for the Christian Science Monitor and also worked in Moscow for the Moscow Times and for Bloomberg News. And finally, nice to welcome Burkhard Birke. He's based at the Berlin studio of the public radio network Deutschlandradio. He has served as the station's correspondent in Brussels, in London, and in Paris. Ina Milinkovska, tell us, do you think this election can really bring a turnaround for your country? I think there are good chances that uh, we will have stable but also reforms capable government uh, because elections are expected to substantially renew political elites in elite the, uh, in the parliament. The uh, supporters of the former President Yanukovych, who currently dominated the old parliament, seek to join the, par the new one uh, in the oppositional bloc, in the party Strong Ukraine, and through the uh, individual majoritarian districts. But their chances are are pretty low. The ultimate winner of these elections will be the bloc of the current president, Petro Poroshenko. Uh, furthermore, and this is perhaps even more important, we will have a few uh, newcomers in the parliament. Uh, these are young democratic parties, but also a group of um, civil society activists and journalists who will join the parliament on different party lists and who already declared their plan to unite together in the Maidan group to push for reforms. So on the one side, we will have increased fragmentation of, of these pro-democratic uh, forces in the parliament, but from the other side, this increased fragmentation does not necessarily um, lead to dysfunctionality of the parliament because the new parliament will be our helmingly pro-European, uh, programmatic and ideologically, uh, the parties are very close to each other. Okay, Lucien Kim, uh, the President Poroshenko's bloc, which Ina Melinkovska just mentioned, uh, is uh, expected to gain the broadest support. Its slogan is living the new way. But if you look on who its list of candidates includes, one would have to say a lot of them live the old way. It includes many members of the current parliament and of the uh, old elite. Well, that's actually caused a lot of frustration within Ukraine. The fact that uh, Poroshenko is also not necessarily a new face. Uh, he's been around a long time in Ukrainian politics. And his, his party, which was uh, formed around him, it's called Bloc, uh, the Poroshenko Bloc, uh, includes uh, people from all sorts of um, different political directions. I think you can also flip it around, though, and say, at the same time, uh, Poroshenko is maybe a very good uh, bridging figure because he is able to include a lot of different voices inside of Ukraine, connect the past maybe with the future, and I think even more importantly for Poroshenko is that he's able to speak um, with uh, President Putin of Russia. Bukhart Birka, what would be the essential elements uh, that would promote greater stability? What would a new government in which uh, President Poroshenko's party is clearly expected to have the dominant uh, role, what would it need to achieve to really get 
Ukraine on stable footing? I think it needs to stabilize the unity of the country and it's the biggest problem and you need President Putin for that. So Poroshenko really needs to keep on dialoguing with Moscow but he needs also at the same time to grant some more rights to the East because in the Eastern part we will not have elections, at least partially not, because the so-called independent uh, Republic of Donetsk will not allow the elections to take place. We don't have elections in Crimea. So actually from an overall view, this, this election is a little bit flawed in the sense that it's not the whole of Ukraine that is voting in this election. Still, we have to recognize that the result of this election will be more valid, will, will represent more the, the will of the uh, people of Ukraine than the actual parliament. It was absolutely necessary to have re-elections, as Poroshenko called for. But uh, the uh, obstacles now of overcoming uh, the split of the countries are huge. And I think uh, we need to discuss uh, giving more rights, uh, like. Uh, more more cultural identity to the East in order to maintain, to be maybe able to maintain the unity of the country. I Let's... would say it's already too late. Sorry to interrupt, but I would say it's already too late. I think the problem is uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, these uh, regions in the East, um, they already live, th exist in their, own, uh, in, in their own sphere. And furthermore, um, there is the opposition bloc, there is a strong Ukraine party, which represents sort of the old the old Yanukovych guard, but it's possible that they won't even reach, uh, get into parliament. So you'll even have this fragmentation and polarization in the parts of Ukraine that Kiev still uh, controls. As Burkhard Birka just told us, Ina Melinkovska, the separatists in the eastern part of Ukraine have said they're not going to take part in the election. They've called on people to boycott and say they want to hold their own poll later on in November. How will that affect the legitimacy of this election and the stability of any government that emerges? Uh, of course, uh, this is a problem, and um, now the uh, government, the current government, is looking how to uh, give a chance for people there to uh, elect. Uh, there uh, was a special law passed that allowed people that uh, are internal refugees in Ukraine to go f and elect for their parties, but there are still people who are in the, those regions, and uh, we know that uh, only a few of uh, lo uh, so election uh, locals will be uh, open there. Uh, but um, I think uh, the best way to integrate those parts will be to give them a good example how the reforms could be conducted and how it could work. This is also the hope for reintegration of Crimea. So if the project of uh, Ukraine democracy and reforms will succeed, then there will be a kind of dissemination effects for legitimation of this government for other regions in the eastern Ukraine and also in Crimea. And I would also say that the chances whether uh, these declared uh, reforms will be implemented depends on politicians but uh, also on the pressure of civil society and during pressure that will uh, make uh, politicians to stand to their commitments but and also support from the EU and international community and eventually it also depends on Russia's policies. Uh, Burkhard Pjöke, the war has played an extremely dominant role in the election campaign so far, indeed, uh, from what I've heard from people uh, in Ukraine, also from colleagues there. It's been the only issue, so to speak. This week we saw evidence that the government itself has been using illegal cluster bombs uh, in uh, what has continued to be a war, despite uh, the, uh, the uh, weapon, uh, the ceasefire. What implications do you think that has for the legitimacy of this government? I think we've been thinking much too long in just these terms. On this side are the good guys, on the other side are the bad guys. I think especially the European policy was focused on the Ukrainians from Kiev, or Poroshenko being the good guys, and the Ukrainian army not uh, uh, not doing any harm or doing the good thing because the country was invaded or was, uh, yeah, with the presence of the rebels and the Russian troops, which evidently were there. Um, but I think we have to see a war is always dirty and both both sides did play dirty. And I mean, if there's really proof of cluster bombs, and I don't think we should doubt the statement, uh, there should be some investigations. And Poroshenko said he's willing to give in and to have investigations that demonstrates that 
the Ukrainian uh, troops are also using, well, not always uh, very, very civilized uh, methods of uh, fighting war. And besides, there are some militia or paramilitary group which fight on the Ukrainian side that are not uh, very, very, well, let's say, um, <laughs> obedient in what is uh, concerning uh, to, to, to abide by the rules of, of a, a clean warfare. So uh, we have to look at, at both sides and both sides are not flawless, let's put it this way. Lucien Kim, will that have any effect on President Poroshenko's uh, election popularity and or on his ability to govern? The fact that crime, war crimes appear to be, have been committed on both sides? <laughs> Absolutely not. I think um, what's, what's happened uh, when you look at Ukraine is that the, pic the picture that's being portrayed in Ukrainian media is one side and the Russian uh, media is another side. And um, these kind of accusations will not affect him uh, domestically. In fact, there's uh, a lot of anger uh, inside uh, the Ukrainian population towards these regions. Um, I'm talking now maybe a little bit more on the fringes, but still people are very angry with these regions at the, the, about the separatist movement. And I'm, I'm sure um, a significant number of people in Ukraine would say, well, you know, People deserve to be b bombed since uh, they, tr they try to uh, leave our country uh, by, armed, by armed means. Oh, this is horrible. I mean, they're civilians and they're innocent. They shouldn't be bombed. I'm just saying what I think uh, is, is, is sort of the, the, the attitude. And w when we look at the way the media uh, there are covering these, uh, these issues, it's not, it's, you won't have the same uh, uproar about this that you would maybe in a more stable society. Inna Melenkovska, tell us something about the role that the, that the war has played in the election campaign. I was told by some colleagues, Western uh, journalists in Ukraine, that they had the impression the war almost gives the government an excuse not to do anything on other issues, but simply to make, to, it basically feeds populism. Would you agree with that? Yes, the war was one of the main topics in the election campaign, and uh, we see that as far as uh, almost all parties uh, were pro-European and uh, the items on their programs were pretty similar so the only one one of the main items where they distinguished was the war and how far you are going to settle this conflict so we have uh, so-called uh, the war parties uh, that uh, stand for more radical solutions and we have also a kind of peace parties that are going uh, willing to go for concessions to um, reach as soon as possible peaceful solutions uh, for Ukraine even um, uh, on the costs of uh, losing uh, control on the part of its territory. Burkhard Birka, there's been a lot of discussion here uh, in the German media, but in Europe in general, about the role that ultranationalists have played in Ukraine, both on the Maidan and since then. Some of the German civil society organizations that are based in Ukraine say they have not seen evidence of as much strength as, uh, as for instance, the Russian media have been reporting. What's your take on that from what you have heard? I know you haven't been in Ukraine, but... Well, I would say that the movements and the activities of the ultra-nationalists is a pretext, especially for the Russian propaganda machine, uh, if I want to call it this way. I mean, a pretext also uh, for a lot of measures, a lot of actions they have taken. So maybe their influence on the ground is not that huge, but they're present. I mean, we should not completely neglect them, and we shall see how they fare also in these elections. Uh, we, we, we will find that out on Sunday. But um, in, in the long run, I think we, we should marginalize, uh, and Poroshenko should try to marginalize these forces in, in the country, uh, which would uh, help him then uh, get uh, his pro-European course uh, with a stronger backing also from the foreign countries. So uh, I, I think that indeed we overestimate the importance and support. Overestimate. Uh, overestimate, yes. And uh, support uh, uh, of these parties in the population is pretty low. So both Radical Party and Svoboda is, uh, are expected not to enter the parliament. So their uh, support is below 5%. On the other hand, I have just seen in reports, Lucian Kim, that there's a new firebrand, uh, Ole Iliasho, who is expected to be a potential power broker in an upcoming government. What are you uh, hearing from your sources? You were there just two weeks ago. How strong are ultra-nationalists and how much of a role could someone like this Liasho play? 
I think in any very polarized situation, which began on the, during the Maidan protests um, and continued um, with the armed conflict in the East, is that it automatically attracts the most radical elements. And Oleg Lashko is definitely a very radical uh, guy. He enjoys uh, the publicity. Um, but there's also, I think, a good deal of skepticism about um, what he really stands for. He's extremely populistic for a certain militant part of the population uh, who like uh, to, see, um, to see action being taken against pro-Russian separatists. Uh, he, he, he definitely appeals to that segment of the population. But I do agree uh, with Ina that uh, it's, it's definitely the role of the ultranationalists is overestimated and it's being used uh, sort of as a uh, bogeyman uh, to represent all of, uh, all of Ukraine. Ina Minkowska, you mentioned the um, refugees uh, the, uh, within Ukraine who had fled from yes. uh, the war zone and apparently who are being very, very poorly cared for. Are they likely to play a role in, in the stability or instability of Ukraine following the election? Um, yes, uh, I think this is a factor. We have uh, around uh, 420,000 uh, of such refugees in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, it, um, and they are taken care uh, dominantly by the volunteers. Uh, there, are, there is uh, very little help from the state till now uh, for these people. And we have a problem with, even with official status for these refugees. Um, but um, in comparison, with the whole population, it's of course a small share of population, so it will not harm legitimacy of the new government so much. And we expect that uh, this group of the people will uh, be rather moderate as they are willing to return to their homes and they want to have peace. So they are rather for this peace party. Burkhard Birke, many outsiders say that the most essential element that would need to change to really create political stability in Ukraine is the economy and, above all, corruption. Would you expect a new Poroshenko government to make true strides in that area? Well, it's a difficult uh, task to take up, and Poroshenko himself uh, is like a chameleon. He has changed so many times colors and so. Uh, uh, in that sense, I mean, it's a huge task to take on. We, we will have a lot of unexperienced newcomers in the parliament probably supporting him, which gives a sort of a fresh air. And let's hope that these guys and these people bring in this fresh air that will wipe off a little bit this corruption. But I, I don't fully trust in Poroshenko really eliminating uh, corruption fully because he comes from this oligarch uh, structure and he himself has uh, enriched himself with his uh, economical uh, activities and uh, I'm very, very uh, <laughs> skeptical. Indeed, in a Menkovska, President Poroshenko has never fulfilled his promises to sell off his chocolate empire or his other businesses, which even include media businesses. That would normally be viewed as a conflict of interest. Hasn't fulfilled any of those promises. Doesn't he in many ways represent that old oligarchic Ukrainian order that certainly has not led to stability in the past? So the oligarchic influences are contingent in Ukraine. They uh, they are evil, but uh, they have also their good sides because they keep uh, Ukrainian political environment competitive and also media environment pluralistic. But uh, coming back to your question, uh, so uh, I think that uh, these uh, issues about his properties were not so um, intensively discussed in the population. But under the pressure of civil society, he passed a few laws that uh, are aimed to strongly fight against corruption. He just signed today the, a few laws uh, on establishment of anti-corruption bureau and on uh, uh, anti-corruption measurements. Uh, so we will see. But I think uh, parallel, in parallel to um, top uh, down uh, fight against corruption. It's also important to uh, look at the dimension of bottom-up fight with the corruption, where the uh, normal, ordinary people uh, do not want to accept corruption as something normal uh, in their lives. So I think we also uh, need to uh, look at this uh, bottom dimension, and there are strong changes in Ukraine that were also revealed in the Maidan protest. People don't want to have corruption anymore. Clearly, a major 
major element on the Maidan. You were there, Lucien Kim. Some of those Maidan activists will be represented in the new parliament, either within President Poroshenko's bloc or as independents. But can they really influence this fight for to break corruption in, in Ukraine? Uh, that's, w that's what they think they can. They think they, um, that they, took, they, they fought on the Maidan, civil society, uh, uh, civic rebellion, and now it's time to take that fight into the parliament. This is uh, th their thinking, that now um, they, th these disputes inside Ukrainian society, they need to uh, sort of uh, be relaxed and, and be uh, discussed in a, in a parliamentary se setting. Um, well, of course, it's a, it's a question whether corruption, Ukraine is one of the most corrupt uh, countries in the world, and whether they... Something like, something like uh, number seven on the list uh, in terms of worst corruption? It's, At least it's, one, one uh, website I saw. Yeah, it's, it, it's very bad, but I, 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 I agree with uh, Ina that there, uh, the Maidan was about um, uh, s civic responsibility. Uh, this was the underlying um, motivation for most people who showed up. And people are sick and tired of it. Um, and Poroshenko has a window of opportunity. He doesn't, he does not, he cannot rule uh, like the presidents before him. Uh, Maidan also had created a precedent that um, if, if, if the government is unable to uh, uh, meet, the, meet the needs of the people, the people will then change the government. So I think... But he's had that window for months now. He's been the president and nothing's happened. Um, there's a huge frustration in Kiev, uh, also among former Maidan activists, at the pace of reforms. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to uh, justify Poroshenko's uh, actions in any way. Um, but he's, at the same time, been uh, fighting a war that he was completely unprepared to uh, fight. So, again, you can, it's a chicken egg, you know, is the war there to delay uh, reforms or are the reforms delayed because of the war? Uh, it's a good question, but I think um, the, just the magnitude of the problems, just the, uh, keeping the uh, integrity of, of the country are so huge um, that it's, it's, it's hard to tackle everything all at once. Just a word, because Ina was speaking about the media, and so why didn't Poroshenko sell his TV channel if he was really want to be impartial in this election, for instance? So this is one step of reform he should have done as well. Yes, but at the same time, he uh, initiate, uh, so he already uh, agreed on the laws that will establish public broadcasting in Ukraine, and it's very important uh, moment. So um, in comparison, relatively okay. We could insist that he sells this uh, five TV channel, but um, at the moment, this is a problem. But I want to also remind that uh, we shouldn't also expect too much from Poroshenko because Ukraine returned to the constitution of 2004 and it's not the president who has the main powers to implement economic or anti-corruption reforms, but the government and uh, the parliament. And in the parliament, we still have a dominance of the representatives of the party of region and the communist party. So uh, he actually had no... Uh, support uh, in the parliament to uh, implement all these necessary reforms. And will that change now with the most likely composition of the new government? Yes. We're told he will have broader support, but we're also told it's going to be a very diverse parliament, some Euromaidan activists, some nationalists, uh, some of the old guard uh, in Poroshenko's bloc, and so on and so forth. Is that not possibly a very splintered and a very unpredictable group that will be elected? But uh, at the same moment, uh, they are, as for these uh, reform items, very uh, close to each other. So, so they definitely agree on the list of reforms that need to be passed. And uh, there are also declarations, for example, from the bloc of uh, Yulia Timoshenko, uh, the party Batkivshina, that uh, they will not go into opposition to the uh, presidential bloc and they will try to cooperate with them. So let's see and wait how this cooperation will look like. But uh, uh, there are good chances that we will have uh, a, com a broad common denominator on reforms and the uh, question will be whether this common denominator of declarations will be implemented into practical actions. Uh, Lucien Kim, how politically savvy are those Euromaidan activists whom you have spoken to? Let's say some of them do now get into parliament. To what degree are they going to be able to play the game? I think uh, there is a very high degree of naivete among uh, the Euro Maidan activists. Um, 
there were already Euromaidan activists in the, uh, in the new government uh, who came, uh, that came into power in February. Uh, some of them also left uh, slamming the door, uh, frustrated by uh, the, way, the slow pace of um, just the, way, the slow wheels of, of, of government. Um, so I think the ex expectations are high and uh, the, the, these young reformers, I think they will notice, you know, how difficult it is to actually get a law passed, what, what, kind, of, um, what kind of pressures uh, exist, and especially in a society uh, uh, like Ukraine, where um, political votes were often just uh, were simply bought w with money. Burkhard Birke, we've mentioned several times the role of civil society. Uh, Ina Melinkowska was fairly optimistic about uh, its potential for influence, but the fact is it is very weak in Ukraine still. What can Western European countries do to provide quick support for the efficacy of civil society? I think this would be exactly the point where like political foundations and all the NGOs could uh, co cooperate with the Ukrainian civil society to build it up. As you said, it's very weak. Share so to, to, to share expertise and, and to just help them how precisely how to, to get a law passed through parliament, how to really express the will, how to gather majorities for certain issues, how to find a common denominator, because I think we've, we always forget that Ukraine, Russia, all these countries have lived uh, 70, 80, 90 years under dictatorship, a communist dictatorship. I mean, for them, democracy is not the same as for us, so that's where we can really help. We can bring students in from Ukraine so that they study here, that they uh, see how Western democracy works. All this needs to be put on the tracks right now, and the European Union should do much more in that field than it's doing actually right now. You know, Milinkowska, you're an example of that in some ways. You are here <laughs> in Berlin uh, working in the political science arena. Will you go back? Will you try to bring that back to your country? And what are you hearing from civil society activists there? What do they need? Uh, so uh, now I'm thinking about uh, returning because there were changes in the education law and my degrees uh, will be recognized, easily recognized in Ukraine. Uh, as for civil society, I'm so optimistic because uh, uh, in addition to uh, the growth of uh, activist, activist numbers and the uh, entrance into politics, we also have uh, the improvements as for the uh, well-discussed weakness of the civil society in Ukraine, it's rootless. So now we, after Maidan, we uh, see that uh, civil society activists have uh, support and get the uh, roots in Ukrainian population. If you look at the talk shows, uh, so this famous Friday talk show in the evening, uh, then uh, and when you see the civil society activists presented, being presented there, they have a huge support of the um, audience when they talk about reform. So we have definitely the roots there, but we sometimes we don't have um, uh, expertise. So I think what I uh, heard from the civil society activists, they need expertise, expertise from uh, European uh, think tanks and European civil society organizations. Now, corruption, of course, was one of the major issues on the Maidan. Another one was the economy. As we all know, the Ukraine economy is in very, very poor shape. The EU has already given it one major cash infusion. Now there's talk about the potential for more. Discussions over Ukraine's outstanding gas bills have been conducted for the past week, but so far with little success. Let's take a look. Among the problems facing Kiev is Ukraine's economic dependence on Russia, particularly in the energy sector. Much of Ukraine's gas imports come from Russia, and a significant amount of Russian gas going to the European Union transits through Ukraine. Last June, Russia cut off its gas supply to Ukraine over Kiev's unpaid bills. This week's EU brokered talks between Ukraine and Russia aimed at ironing out Kiev's ability to pay ended without a deal. Negotiations are set to resume next week. Ukraine has asked the EU for an additional loan of 2 billion euros to help. As winter approaches, an interruption of gas supplies would endanger not only Ukraine, but several EU countries. 
Listen, Kim, what do you think? Are those talks, uh, when they resume next week, likely to uh, proceed more smoothly if there is a new and broader government that's going to come into place? The gas, um, the gas problem, Ukraine's gas problem is probably one of its ma biggest challenges and has, has been uh, Russia's main lever for uh, controlling uh, the country. So I don't know if a, a, a new government will uh, necessarily have any more power than uh, the, the old one did. Um, but I do, I do actually see a, a solution uh, to this gas problem. Um, Ukraine is uh, very dependent still on, on Russian gas, uh, but Russia is also dependent on Ukraine for uh, transiting gas to Europe. Uh, furthermore, uh, after annexing Crimea, Russia is dependent on Ukraine for transporting water and electricity to Crimea. So um, I don't know if we'll he ever hear this in public, but I can imagine at least for this winter, maybe some deal coming to pass where Ukraine will agree to continue supplying Crimea with uh, water and electricity in exchange for gas. But we'll just have to see. Um, th these debates often uh, last really to the last, uh, last minute. Burkhard Birke, um, we do have a ceasefire in place, more or less. Uh, talks have been held on the gas issue. Gas, of course, has been the tug of war between Russia on the one hand, Ukraine, and the EU on the other. What do you think? Are we likely to see real movement forward? And has the worst of the Russian EU tension been resolved, or is it likely to resurface? I hope for it. I mean, uh, I think that they should strike a gas deal next week because it's a win-win situation. And as uh, Lucien said, uh, actually, Crimea needs uh, needs uh, the electricity, the water, all from Ukraine, unless uh, the Russians and the rebels take up a piece of land which makes the connection uh, of land between Crimea and the Russian state. So that would be uh, that would mean that the war actually would return because they would have to conquer this uh, this territory. So, with that vision, with that facing that threat, I mean, I think the European Union will do what it's in its powers to help Ukraine pay off its bills, which is one of the preconditions. A lot of money involved there. A lot though. of money. Are you really ready to ante up that kind of money? Um, I think they have no choice. I just simply think they have no choice because what would be the alternative? Maybe having the rebels and with the help of Russian troops again conquering territory, having the war come back? I don't think this is in neither interest. So I think uh, definitely the, the EU and the IMF, they all will fork out some money. We're talking about $2 billion um, to help uh, Ukraine pay off its bills and, and also to get their gas to Europe. In Melinkovska, right from the start of the crisis in your country, there have been predictions that surely Russia would see the light, surely Mr. Putin would begin to act in a more rational fashion. He's confounded us many times. Might he not confound us again on the topic of gas, even if it would very much be in Russia's interest to find an agreement? Um, I think uh, now after Milan meetings, we could expect certain concession on this issue and uh, um, already this readiness for the uh, renewal of gas supplies is a sign that, for me, it's a sign that uh, sanctions of the EU and international community and indirect sanctions on financial and energy markets work. So uh, what we see, Russia budget uh, is dependent on uh, its uh, gas exports and I think that uh, we see the uh, great financial troubles in Russia and I see these concessions and this kind of ceasefire now is a certain uh, a sign that uh, Russia at least still uh, decided to have a break for the winter. Not only that the sanctions seem to work, especially like for yeah. the oil exploring, but the oil price has gone down. It was George Soros who said the most effective sanction against Russia would be pushing the oil price per barrel way below the $100 mark. So let's have a look at the markets. It's way below $100, and this means that Russia has enormous budget problems. They can't pay actually their bills anymore if the oil price stays below $100 for a long time. And this is putting pressure on President Putin of also trying to get 
rid of this problem of agreeing a deal and of having the sanctions eventually lifted. So you're all three fairly optimistic that a deal will be reached, Lucien Kim, but what about the larger tension between Europe and Russia and between Ukraine's, the western part of Ukraine's aspirations to grow closer to the EU? Do you really see that tension now waning? Unfortunately, I don't. I was, I was, I've just returned from Moscow and uh, what we see going on right now uh, in Russia is um, this feeling that uh, we're surrounded, the world is against us. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that a leader has done that in his country. Uh, so it's, it's, I think Russia is preparing, or Putin is preparing Russia sort of for a, a, long, uh, a long march uh, in isolation, uh, which, is quite, uh, which is quite worrying. Um, as far, and, and so I, th I, th I think, um, um, you know, we can probably look forward to uh, continuing conflict. The big, the big worry in Ukraine is that the uh, European Union will now, if the situation calms down in eastern Ukraine, uh, that the European Union will ease up on the sanctions. And one uh, Ukrainian diplomat I spoke to uh, recently said, well, you know, what's really important is that the European Union sticks to the sanctions until uh, until Russia leaves Crimea, of course, that sounds um, rather uh, optimistic and, and unrealistic. Um, but the Ukrainians, the, this is the Ukrainian position, and they're extremely worried uh, that the, the European will will uh, slowly wane. What we also have to remember is that many uh, smaller Eastern European countries, which do belong to the European Union, uh, for example, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, the Baltic countries, are also very dependent on Russian energy. So they are also starting to feel a hit. Um, and they are not willing to risk their uh, economic well-being uh, for the sake of Ukraine. Bukhat Birka, so far your government, uh, Germany, has played a very important diplomatic role in trying to defuse the crisis and has been quite steadfast, ultimately, on the issue of sanctions. Would you expect that to continue if the election creates a broader government that looks at least somewhat more stable? Will the pressure let up here in Berlin to stick with the sanctions? Uh, it, all, it all depends. Um, I think uh, that indeed Germany has been a key player in the whole field and um, Germany is in the lead and I think it all depends. I think behind the scenes they have already written off Crimea. I think uh, nobody really thinks that they could reverse this decision of the annexation. I don't think any serious politician. There was even talk of behind the scenes talk between Germany and Russia and the Ukraine of accepting the annexation and then maybe getting a peace deal done. Um, so I think eventually if uh, we, the West, will accept the annexation of Crimea and then Russia will stay off eastern uh, Ukraine, um, maybe some more auto autonomy for this region, then eventually we strike a deal. Just they want peace. But there's one major thing about Putin. I think he's very, very, very traumatized by one issue which happened 25 years ago when the wall came down because the civil rights movement in Eastern Germany was in Dresden where he was based as a KGB officer. They were storming first the Stasi, so the Secret Service archives, and then they were going to the KGB. And there was one man standing there with a, at gunpoint holding off the civil uh, movement and saying, you don't move one step. So he's traumatized and he is afraid that the Maidan movement, these protest movements will oust him, will oust him of power, will get him out of his power. I think this is his personal trauma, which he hasn't overcome as a KGB officer, which he's still living in as a president. So he has all the interest of not wanting this Maidan revolution in one way or, or another uh, succeed. That's a because we do not have a lot of time, let's, um, I would love to talk some about politics in Russia, but I'm going to resist the temptation and ask you, uh, Ina Melenkovska, you mentioned at the beginning the fact that President Poroshenko, who is likely to be reelected, has fairly good abilities to at least speak with Putin, to uh, get a dialogue going. Together with sanctions, if they remain in place for a while, what might that achieve in terms of the East? We're told that Russia might well like to see a frozen conflict, a state of instability just continue, not hot war, something cooler than that, but something that would obviously be a terrible drag on the ability of Ukraine to, to, to turn around. 
What needs to happen there? And what can actually realistically be achieved by President Poroshenko? I think uh, that sanctions do their job. Uh, and I uh, just wanted to remind that san uh, so serious sanctions were imposed not because of Crimea, but because of the exaggeration of the conflict in the East. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, the sanctions could be also East uh, just because the situation will improve in the East, but we don't see this so far. Uh, so uh, Minsk declaration are part partially already implemented by uh, Ukrainians side, uh, Russia do nothing and rather block the OCE monitoring mission. As we uh, heard yesterday, uh, the monitoring mission is pretty limited and uh, would be and was able to prolong its function just for months because of uh, Russia's veto. So I think uh, what we need uh, to stop this conflict or to settle it for for time is to have a good monitoring of the ceasefire there and in the long term uh, the best receipt uh, for the President Poroshenko will be to implement reforms in the other part of the country where the, the government has control. Lucien Kim, uh, going forward, as I said, our title is Steps Towards Stability. What are the two or three steps that we should all be watching for to see whether Ukraine really is on the way? Well, first of all, it's um, making sure that the ceasefire does hold. Uh, of course, it's only been a ceasefire in name. Uh, hundreds of people have died since the ceasefire uh, was, uh, went into effect on September 5th. Um, and we really need to look at, um, I completely agree with Ina, um, President Poroshenko is in a very tight position. The one thing he can do uh, is implement reforms in the part of Ukraine uh, where Kiev still has control and set an example uh, for other regions. But that is really um, quite a big challenge to accomplish. And Bukhat Birka, very briefly, uh, key things that the West uh, needs to provide in order to help that process move forward? They need to support Ukraine, Poroshenko, especially now with the gas, and uh, they should maybe pro put forward a solution like Switzerland with cantons and give in, in more dependence to certain regions in Ukraine. That's a real part two answer there. <laughs> we certainly could come back and discuss that proposed solution another time. Hope we can. So many thanks to all of you for being with us here today. And thanks to all of you out there for joining us. Uh, stay with us and uh, see you soon.